that pill, if you want to call it that, intelligent pill, at the time was already small enough by then to implant under the skin with a horse needle, a large hypodermic needle. And I was shown these, and they worked. And we could read them with a primitive hand wand type reader from about seven or eight feet away. And this was still primitive technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, at the time in the security industry, a lot of us had a lot of concerns about tracking and locating people that had been kidnapped, particularly what was going on in Europe at the time where we were having NATO officers, even the Prime Minister of Italy, kidnapped. And these people were drained or they were brutalized or both. And one of the goals of the industry was to develop technology that would allow us to track these people or locate them quickly, hopefully to save their lives, but on a secondary basis to keep them from being drained of sensitive information. And I brought this technology to a meeting in a skiff room in Virginia that was arranged by a friend of mine with the CIA and another friend of mine with the State Department at the time to introduce this technology to what we felt at the time were the right parties to use this new technology responsibly. Now, I hadn't heard about the remnant or any other religious beliefs at the time that said that everybody was going to be implanted with some sort of marking system, a uh, law of the beast or 666. I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of that stuff at the time. And I was taking this as a serious solution to a potentially problematic, a problem that would not go away. And it was interesting, we met in this room, and because of the tight meetings we were involved with, certain people would not introduce their, give you their full name or where they came from. I just had to trust that my two contacts had contacted the right parties to be there at the right time and that they would all be responsible individuals. There was a mistake. After that meeting, I discovered that two of the people in the meeting had never been asked there, yet they knew about the meeting. They knew what it was about. They knew who was going to be there. And later research indicated that one of them actually worked for the Department of Agriculture and one of them worked for the Department of the Treasury. What prompted our looking at these two men was that the way they asked the questions, the questions they asked, the attitude behind them, even the body language, indicated that they had reasons for the use of this technology other than the one that was intended at the meeting. In fact, their largest concern was how fast could we make a couple billion of them? And could we each get each one of those a unique identity number? Now, this particular pill-shaped device, very minute, had a lot of flexibility in its capabilities. It was basically just a almost a transponder. You would send a frequency to it, and it would respond back with its unique number which not, could not be changed once the chip was made. Yet there were a lot of capabilities that could be added to this chip, such as monitoring temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and even waveforms out of the brain. And, but that was for research down the road. What was amusing to me a few months ago on a website uh, that uh, likes to cre uh, collect articles on the unusual is that a lady out east had a chip removed from her body in uh, 1999. They had it blown up on the website and it was a slight modification of this chip from Denver with some of its enhancements and it was put in her she believes in the, either 1980 or 1981. What was amusing about this was that this gentleman never had to worry about money again and he quietly passed on a lot of this technology to somebody we never knew. And this concerned my contacts in Washington because it never went anywhere with them. Somebody else took it and ran with it, and we never knew who it was. Now, in 1984, I found another technology by just sniffing the web, sniffing the, the, the literature of our industry, and a dozen other industries, and I found that there was a professor at the University of New South Wales, who where I still have the files on, that had discovered a way to make a microscopic lithium niobate chip. 
and by accident he had scratched it and he had a um, RF transmitter there and he had a receiver on by sheer chance and he found that on a uh, certain frequency he could send an energy beam to the chip and it would respond back with a number. He worked on that technology and that technology eventually I found out about. We flew him in to Denver to our company, System Group of Colorado, and we did a test. He had some primitive small chips he brought with him. They are totally passive and very small, a 32nd of an inch, and only a couple thousandths thick. And by etching them, you could again create a unique signature, unique to each one. And this one theoretically could depending on the size of it and the size of the etching, could have a unique number in the billions and billions. In fact, the uh, test we did was amusing in that we <clears throat> set up a transmitter and a receiver based on removing a air grill from our drop ceiling and plugging up our transceiver into that as our antenna. And we were able to read that thing glued to a little piece of, ply of uh, cardboard from a hundred feet away with a piece of grill out of a drop ceiling, which is a, a pretty primitive antenna. Because we didn't know what frequency it was dealing with, so we had to come up with some kind of instant generic antenna. We were so impressed with the capabilities of this, it would read through thin layers of material, like thin plywood. And we were so impressed that again I felt that this was a technology that truly had some value. Because we also discovered in some testing that papers, the papers work he had with him, that if we had a microscopic coil antenna with this, that we could read this from a mile away. And his later on analysis, a few weeks later, he got back to me and said that if we had an antenna, a coil antenna two inches in diameter with a chip in the middle, and that the, what the antenna is actually doing is acting as an amplifier to a great extent and that what sends back out is a harmonic of the original frequency. That his numbers crunching showed that he could read this thing from 120 kilometers in space. And that there were other attributes of this chip that could be tied into it, especially if it was powered in some minute way. And give it a lot more kickapoo juice. Well again, I took this in a lot more care this time to a meeting that we had in Virginia at a subcontractor's company that I knew that does a lot of work for the Intel community. This time I had the director of, the, of security for all of State Department there, and again, a good friend from CIA. Again, we had, at the last minute, people walk in the door with the right credentials, but we didn't know who they were exactly. It turns out, again, we had people, two this time again, who we, after the meeting, we realized shouldn't have been there. And yet they had credentials that were awesome. Because it turns out afterwards I found out they had never been called by my two contacts. Yet they knew about our phone calls. They knew of exactly what time, what place, and what we were going to be talking about. And supposedly my phone calls were made over secure phone lines. What concerned me more about this particular event was that I have in my records again the name uh, at the time of the head of security at State Department. And I got to know him well because I designed the security system, at least a major portion of it, for Main State or the headquarters in Foggy Bottom in D.C. And so he and I knew each other very well. And that one of the things that Bob wanted to do was before he retired, he wanted to have his family, particularly his two boys in high school, experience what it was like to live off out of the country. So he actually gave himself the job. He demoted himself to head of security for East Africa. And he, they, he and his family shortly after this event, this meeting, moved to Kenya, to Nairobi. And he and I quietly kept in touch through our other contact in Washington. And he kept probing who these two men were. We were having a devil of a time finding who they were, who they really were. Because uh, what bothered me was that the professor all of a sudden got a giant grant 
The technology was transferred. He never had to work again the rest of his life. And a friend of mine in San Francisco, who I had quietly told about this technology, because he was involved with other aspects of national security and tracking people, he got a project to do a physical security system, access control, cameras, intrusion monitoring, everything that works, for a little company in Silicon Valley. And he said it was eerie to him, but what they were making there looked eerily like what I had described to him. He built the security system in this modern fab, building billions of these little chips. He wound up a year later being asked if he'd want to buy the security system back. They were shutting the factory down after they'd made billions and billions of these little chips. And it was a division of a rather major European electronics firm that had the plant. Siemens. Siemens. And what concerned me was that they had built these chips and who knows what happened to them. And they built them in the billions in volume because they're so small that you can take a six inch wafer and make hundreds of thousands of them on a wafer. And they disappeared somewhere. But in the process, what concerned me more was Bob did not give up trying to find out who these guys were and who they worked for, what their agendas were. He and I had had long talks of now by the mid-80s about what was really going on in government, who was controlling what, what concerns he had. Because he had come to the realization there were a lot of things going on that weren't right. And he had supposedly made some contacts to find out more of what was going on. And he had contacted our mutual friend at CIA, another con long-term contractor, been involved since World War II, in the very founding of the CIA, who got in touch with me and said, Bob's got something hot, and when he's back in the country again on business, we're going to get a meeting. A few days later, Bob was on his way to work just after dropping the two boys off at a private high school, I believe, in Nairobi. He was on the way to the embassy, and he was broadsided at a stoplight at 60 miles an hour by a reinforced Land Rover. He was killed instantly. The Brit that supposedly was drunk at 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, was taken to the hospital and immediately disappears. And all the evidence he had given in the way of documentation was proven to be phony as to who he was, and Bob was killed. And it was a hit. And it's always concerned me today that he had gotten a little too close to who had been involved with this implantable chip technology. We'd been trying to for a couple of years then, quietly trying to find out who had been doing it without our government realizing it was going on. Because whoever it is has got total ability to penetrate anytime, anywhere, our government and locate what is going on instantly. Who do you think they are? Research since the early 80s on my own and with some friends indicates that we have at least four power groups in the world. They have wealth beyond all imagination. They have advanced technologies. They have taken over various programs, particularly black programs, within our government and probably even the Russian government and the Chinese. Their politics to them, as we know it, is not the same. And they have agendas totally unlike what our governments, we perceive our government's agendas really are. And that they are able to track unbelievably what's going on around them. At, at, at a minute level. And who these people are, we are, my friends and I have given them names, but they, they have no relevance uh, to what they recall themselves. We just simply call them the four horsemen. And that these horsemen work together in, at times and they work against each other at times. There's an ongoing battle between them at a low level to who's going to be top dog in the world. The one commonality to all four appears to be an absolute desire for control of everything and everything. And that uh, they, some of them have different bases for this. From the point of view of it, each of them has their own philosophy. And that core root philosophy guides them supposedly in their actions. And we believe that this is what was causing a lot of strange things to happen in Nevada that we were experiencing, and, it, and in a, on a strange way, correlates also with what happened with these implantable chip technologies 
that I personally brought, now I look at it, to the wrong people in the government. 